Hi everyone, thanks for joining me with Anna Claiborne today. I hope that I'm not butchering her last name here. Uh, Anna is uh, one of the great examples of how technology needs powerful women to make products better and faster. I must say that, you know, I have been following her work before Packet Fabric and, you know, I'm very impressed. Uh, we don't have enough engineers in this in this world, I must say, whether it's software development, whether it's uh, product development, whether it is you know, network engineering systems, we need more. And having very powerful women is just makes everything better. I gotta say, as a as a married man and also you know partners and employee, you know I employ a lot of powerful women. But before that, as you know, we are going to do our. Hi, Anna. How are you? Hey, Mehmet. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. I'm glad to be here. Well, Anna, where, where do you live? I live in between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe in California. I live okay. in the foothills. It's actually it's actually it's the lesser known wine country, but it's really gorgeous. So. All right. Awesome. So in California, how was everything with you? How are you dealing? Let's start with that. That's the first question that I ask everyone. How are you dealing with this new normal? New normal. So this is either um, this is either going to be an awesome response or a very sad response. Is that I don't know that my life has changed all that much <laughs> because okay I uh, we actually are a globally remote distributed company at, at Packet Fabric, and so I've worked remotely now for quite some time. And this isn't uh, even before this. Um, you know, my past couple companies were remote as well. So the um, you know the change has been less so. You know, probably the biggest change is just having the the kids home from school. Uh, so that's that's the biggest difference. And you know, obviously not being able to you know go out and and engage in a lot of like the normal activities. But as far as work life, it stayed. Um, you know, there's been very little change. Uh, how about working at home, having uh, also kids at home because before you know kids were at least I think going to school and more outside activities they're pretty much more at home now some of well, how how is that impacting work if anything or is it is it better so, yeah so I have actually so over um, I've had two kids over two startups now <laughs> which both successful kids both successful startups and um, actually like I like I'm I love having them at home I'm used to it and uh, I thought it was really fun because I got to teach my daughter all about Zoom. You know, she got set up with her own Gmail account, um, her own Zoom account, uh, you know, multiple other things on her like Chromebook. You know, we did all this, you know, sort of fun configuration that we hadn't done before. And um, I got to teach her how to take Zoom meetings, you know, with her teacher. And uh, so I thought it was great. And it also helps out a lot that um, my husband is full time stay at home dad. So I have, I realize that I have a lot of luxuries that um, other people that might not have to where this is a super fun experience instead of one that, um, you know, maybe a little bit less fun. So I'm very thankful for that. Well, since you are, an, you know, one of the technologies product experts, I am also trying something new today. So I was, I was okay. trying to uh, arrange that. So we are now for the first time also live on LinkedIn. Uh, Ooh, cool. <laughs> You know, one of the questions that I think that our, uh, you know, a lot of people that will ask uh, when they first hear the name Packet Fabric, what is Packet Fabric? Can you quickly tell us that? Because then I want to ask you some more questions about, uh, you know, technology. Tell sure. us a little bit about Packet Fabric, please. So uh, Packet Fabric is, um, we are doing for network what Amazon did for compute, right? Everybody's very familiar with uh, the cloud computing story, right? You know, it, it started out that you were racking and stacking servers back in the old days and, you know, cabling them and doing all these things yourself. And then along came cloud computing and all that became available through an API and a UI and it became very easily consumable. Uh, that never happened with network. And that's what we have done is, you know, we've taken a um, now multi-continent 
network and made it all accessible through an API and a UI so that you can put all that programmatic uh, programmatability around it. Hard word to say. And um, and also, you know, just simply deploy network connectivity with a click and it takes like a minute. You know, it is exactly that. It's spinning up resources very rapidly the same way that you spin up compute on cloud. So Anna, one of the, uh, you know, big things that happened last year for Packet Fabric is that you guys were able to raise uh, $75 million, if I remember correctly, about August. It's almost a year, you know? Uh, yeah. What what has changed? What what that seventy five million dollar uh, did for Packet Fabric? Uh, so it's enabled us. Um, that's this is really like the start of our scale. Um, we've just started to scale up. We've made a lot of big improvements, um, foundational improvements in the software that are going to help us go into the next uh, three years. You know, we're going to be bringing on um, a lot a lot more integrations. You know, we have existing integrations with the major cloud providers, some of the lesser known cloud providers. We're going to be doing even more of those. Um, we're going to be starting some really cool new products. We're going to be moving, um, you know, maybe maybe just a little bit above our standard layer two layer two networking, and we're going to be expanding to more global locations. So it's going to awesome. be yeah. The, the end of twenty twenty is going to be uh, um, a lot a lot of really cool changes coming out for us. Am I going to see you guys finally in Latin America? Maybe I'll say maybe. She can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> so uh, I have a question in general about the new normal, right? So yep. Packet Fabric is, uh, you know, providing this easy to expand network options for customers. Cloud is booming, you know. Yep. It's just that people cannot find enough capacity. I keep hearing from people, hey, you know, there are no servers. There now. I'm I'm also one of the cloud providers myself in Latin America and I can tell you you know we rack a full we, we buy things now as, as rack pre-racked and they come in yep. we enable and then like in two hours we're like okay we just run out okay maybe we should have ordered it's it's hard to manage of course capex and everything but well, I that's why that that's why people that's why people love it right they're passing I, on those problems to somebody else so they're passing those problems on to you and me <laughs> so tell tell me a little bit about how what this new normal looks like for you like if you were to look at your growth and you know the the demand six months versus now and let's also try to look at the automation piece because you know i think you're a big fan of automation and make things easier for yourself as well yeah very big fan <laughs> um so the demand, um, the demand has changed definitely like crazy. Um, the demand in the last four months is like nothing we've ever seen before, and that's because we are in a situation that we've never seen before, right? Um, you know, nobody, nobody in our generation, or even most of the people that are around right now, have have seen a pandemic. So this is something completely new, and uh, you know it is just so different because we have the internet, right? Like, um, you know, back at the last pandemic in the you know, 1918 flu pandemic, the internet didn't exist, right? People couldn't just isolate themselves in their houses. And the reason we can do that now is because of the internet and because of the tools that we have available. Um, so it's a pretty unique situation. And of course that, that means that there's gonna be so much more stress on all those tools and all those providers. You know, we've seen people, um, you know, I we have obviously customers on our network um, who are part of those segments, who are part of doing voice and video and learning tools and all this. And we've had uh, customers turn up, you know, we had somebody turn up three, 300 gigs over, you know, two days. Wow. <laughs> so this, um, it is, you know, there's some pretty serious increases in demand out there. And that's sort of the amazing thing is that somebody, you know, is that customers can come to us and they can upgrade one gig to a hundred gig in uh, a minute, you know, or or they can turn up multiple hundred gigs. And uh, and so we definitely helped um, help save. Uh, I would like to think that we helped save at least um, some of the internet and made a couple of lives better in that process um, because we were able to help get people that capacity that they they needed and. Um, you know, and I really like the broadband situation is, of course, a big part of why we can do that. You know, everybody actually has good broadband with their home now. And, you know, we can stream Netflix, uh, you know, high definition 4K. And, and that's great. But, you know, the content still has to be it has to be available. And these big global back backbones that transport it have to be available. And um, that's what, you know, we, we're able to, to help enable right now. So I'm glad that we're able to contribute. 
So one of the things that is happening right now, as you're aware, uh, you know, this pandemic is the second phase without, you know, you know, us losing the first phase is coming back. And one of the concerns when at the beginning of this, everybody have experienced was the, the hardware, optics, you know, fiber, you know, in some cases, capacity, you know, yeah. because, you know, you don't always necessarily have 10 times the capacity ready, you know, waiting for you in every single path, right? This is, yep. we, we also need to cost optimize, you know, supply chain has been an issue. So have you been impacted? Have how packet fabric has been dealing with the supply chain related issues, if any? So, um, I mean, one of the great things is, is that we have, um, you know, we have dark fiber in a lot of the really high demand areas. So we're able to turn up, um, you know, we're able to turn up capacity pretty fast if we need it. So in that sense, we've been, you know, we've been very lucky that, we, you know, we've been able to stay ahead of demand because of our original planning and, and how we built the network, um, which is great. And as far as like the equipment stuff, I, there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, there's definitely a lot of sort of uh, froth around the supply chain right now. We started looking at this, um, you know, at PTC. Uh, it came out that there was somebody that, you know, may have had COVID that was at PTC. And it was interesting because we had been following it in China just as part of, um, you know, good due diligence of, you know, running, running a business, being an executive team. When something like this comes up, you have to pay attention to it. So we had been following it and as soon as, as soon as we heard that it really sort of hit home and I was like, maybe we should, you know, like um, we should do a little bit of supply chain, uh, you know, triage there. And we did order some extra equipment and extra op optics. Um, nothing, nothing insane. It's helped us keep ahead of growth really well. Uh, we've definitely seen some delays on um, equipment being provided, so I'm glad that I'm glad that we did it. I don't know that it's quite as bad as any as anyone thought, uh, and it's really sort of dependent on the commodity, right? You know, we've seen some weird things like fiber just takes forever to get, um, you know, and uh, you know other things maybe are not such a big deal like optics. You know, have not seemed like such a big deal to to procure. Uh, I think a lot of people did a little bit of hoarding there, you know, like optics might've been the new, but might've been like the network toilet paper. And <laughs> yes, memory, memory optics, you know, hard drive, not so much CPU, not so much, but definitely, especially the hundred gig, you know, AOC cables, which I've been complaining about not being able to find or taking forever. So, yeah. Yeah. Then we actually had customers, um, like I said, again, thankfully we were in the position, we had customers who couldn't get hundred gig optics and we were like, well, we can give you, you know, we can loan you some, it's, it's not a problem uh, because they couldn't like the other side of something. So, awesome. yeah. so it, it did happen. I'm just not, I'm, I'm not sure it was the scale that everybody thought it was going to happen. Um, and I do know that planes are running. I have a, I have a good friend up here who's actually a pilot for United and he was a commercial, um, commercial pilot and he's actually been doing cargo runs over to Asia um, into, into Shenzhen right now um, to help, you know, augment getting um, supplies from over there back to the States. So, uh, wow. you know, there are a lot of workarounds that are happening. Wow. wow. By the way, we are getting a lot of questions. Uh, again, I would like to remind my friends to not text me their questions because I need to pay attention to my special guest here, but we have one from LinkedIn, uh, Ajinkya is asking quick question can we say packet fabric is an is a stn company similar to velo versa so there are similarities there are there are similarities and there are differences um we are sdn more in the middle mile sense like we uh velo and versa they are software for connecting endpoints over the internet right over the public internet we are a private network so we actually own the full network stack you know, all the way down from the fiber, all the way up to the UI that you see. So we're not just software running on top of it. Uh, we are the actual network as well. All right. Well, thanks for answering that question. Uh, anybody who wants to ask questions to Anna, this is the this is what makes this show, uh, you know, a little bit unique. This is not rehearsed. The only thing we rehearse is just a couple of messages. Hey, Anna, you want to join my program? Yes, let's do it. That's it. And we are live, natural. Anna, this year, any travels last time i saw you you were at ptc any yeah. more any more travels this year what's what's the travel looking like for you so that's a really good question um and actually you know it's funny because when you asked me before about differences in the new normal is one of them is so my my daughter my oldest 
she grew up on a plane, right? She went everywhere with me. And the youngest now is, you know, he kind of was growing up in the same style because, you know, I haven't had my kids travel with me for work. He hasn't been on a plane now for a while. And he gets super excited when he sees them in the sky. He's like, plane, because I think he like kind of remembers that he used to do that and he doesn't do that anymore. And I do not know when, um, when my next trip is going to be. We were thinking about just doing an actual vacation in August. And even that, I'm like, well, where are we going? You know, where are we going? I, I, Somewhere driving distance maybe is much more better option nowadays. Yeah, yeah, you? we're we're probably gonna go camping, and so that's like, hey, um, that's the safest option. I've been telling yep. my family, like, hey, let's just rent rent an RV and just go camp somewhere. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a ton of na of like national parks that I've never been to in the states, and so I like that's kind of exciting in a way. Like, um, you know, that's been. It's really interesting. One of the conversations that we were having at the beginning of this whole pandemic at work is that some of the more extroverted salespeople, you know, were feeling a little panicky because um, they weren't being able to get out. And, um, you know, I kind of look at everything, you know, I, I like to see the silver lining on everything. And one of the great silver linings about this has been that, you know, everyone has been able to spend more time with their families, um, you know, more time focusing on things like, you know, are you eating well? Are you exercising well? And one of the other benefits to that is instead of worrying about going to whatever exotic location for a vacation, it's like, there's all this great stuff that I've never seen in my backyard. So what, <laughs> exactly. a, what, a, what a great time to explore. <laughs> so I have a question from Matt Levine. Matt, hi, Matt. By the way, uh, I want to invite Matt. Matt as well to our show uh, later, but he has a great question. Before that, I want to close this uh, travel topic with how about packet fabric team? I mean, you guys have a lot of, uh, you know, had at least in the past sales activities engineering activities do you guys see any travel this year as a team do you have a policy is it, i'm i'm asking this because like for example yesterday with nigel nigel basically said look oh, okay. i i won't be traveling for another year you know yeah. i i can't not just this year but even like beyond that another six months this reshapes the way that we've been interacting yeah and some you know companies some conferences i, I predict that you know the conferences that we've been attending will just disappear from the world because of the sustainability and the finances. What are some yeah. of your, you know, what is your travel policy for the rest of the year? So um, our travel policy is basically that it's, uh, you know, we have, we have no um, marketing events. We have nothing like that that is planned. Uh, you know, our travel policy is, is that if somebody has something critical to attend to to travel, they, um, they can do it. But even our, even our field engineers, I mean, we've been largely using, um, you know, remote hands or people, you know, based in an area, our field engineers have not been going out. Um, it's the most important for us to keep our people safe. I, you know, obviously, since we are a you know, we're considered a critical industry, you know, so for those people that do have to travel our field engineers that really do have to go out to solve a problem, you know, we've made sure that they have all the, you know, the proper letters and everything from, uh, can't remember the department, but, um, you know, make sure that they have everything that they need to to travel. Uh, but for the most part, everybody's staying put. And I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. And, and for us, it wasn't, it wasn't a big change. You know, we were basically a pandemic ready company, um, because we, we were all, glo um, you know, globally distributed work at home. And so it, it, it's nice in the sense that it, you know, it was zero disruption um, to our, you know, to our company culture, the way that we work, the way that we interact um, for all, of, you know, for all of us, this is absolutely status quo. And I like, I'm more curious how it will change, you know, all the people that were going into an office before that now realize that was completely unnecessary. That is going to be the really interesting thing to me is, you know, uh, what's going to happen to all those jobs, you know, where people really genuinely thought that they needed to be in an office. And now I've realized that they do not at all. Um, I told I needed an office. I bought a house that has a dedicated office. <laughs> you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about, by the way, so that I don't have to be hearing the kids screaming at each other because, you know, one of the one of them killed the other one and for playing Fortnite. <laughs> so from that standpoint, I'm OK. But I got to tell you one thing that, you know, I see and hear from a lot of people and that might trigger other big issues to happen in business is you know, shutting down the real estate. Like I myself have six, seven office locations across Latin America. I told everyone, guys, you're not going back working from an office this year, period. Yeah. 
by the way, they're just going to be like, oh, are you serious? No, I wasn't joking earlier today in the, in the meeting. So I'm really serious. Um, I want to go to Matt's question. Yeah. So uh, would you like to take that, take on that one? Let's see. Yeah. Um, and I like, well, I mean, I guess I would like, I need to clarify if those are egress fees that we're going to charge our customers or, um, and I think that's what you mean, Matt, is that, uh, if we're going to, um, or if the cloud providers are going to start chart. Okay. Well, let me answer this in a couple ways. I'll answer it from every way that it can be answered. Um, so yeah, egress fees in the cloud are crazy. And, um, that's one of the big appeals of using someone like Packet Fabric is that you can do a direct attachment to a lot of those cloud providers and you can help eliminate a lot of those egress fees from going in and out of the from going in and out of the internet. So um, you know hopefully and it's interesting because uh, well it does offer you know it, it certainly makes a cloud provider more sticky to have that direct attachment and it provides a better end user experience but there is some impact on um, on the economics right because they are able to charge a lot for those egress fees between, you know, whether it's regions or out of the cloud in general. And, um, you know, it, it makes me curious if they're ever gonna see that as a whole and try to patch it up in, in the existing models. Um, Actually, Matt respond that clouds charge. Yes, okay, good. So I am answering it from the right standpoint, okay. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And um, I wish I, you know, I wish I could answer it. And I wish I knew the answer, because it would definitely be some, you know, it would be like amazing to have a crystal ball that would tell me that. Uh, I think that there's, I mean, whenever there's a large barrier like that, people already have a lot of problems with egress fees, you know, it is a it's an opportunity in the market, right. And so it's an opportunity for other cloud providers to come in and disrupt who aren't doing that besides the majors. So, you know, who knows what the future holds. I have a good question. So Kevin uh, is asking, when you expand into these new regions, uh, what are the language ba barriers in bringing customers? Uh, you know, what what kind of barriers are you dealing with? Oh yeah, interesting. Yes, so there definitely there's definitely some some language barriers, and um, right now we're fortunate that we have uh, since again global global distributed work at home company we actually have a lot of people that speak a lot of languages we have pretty much all the european languages covered um so basically like our strategy what we've done is just we will recruit right if there's a sales call with somebody um you know who could only speak french we'll recruit within the company for who can speak french and french and be a translator um one of the one of the very first sort of super cool things i think we did is uh we help provide connectivity for Samsung to do a virtual reality stream of the X Games in Minneapolis, and I had to deal with the Samsung home office in Korea. And you know, thankfully, we're also in an industry that is filled with people who speak different languages. So, uh, you know, I just looked at my LinkedIn contacts real quick, and I was like, "Oh, I know who speaks Korean," and I was able to get them to come help me and uh, be a translator. And you know, think they're a technical translator too, which is even which is the best. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Sometimes it's very hard when you have somebody in the room that just speaks the language but doesn't understand the technology behind it. Yep. So Anna, we have one more question. I want to bring that on. So this is the, what makes this event is very different than any others. It's just we connect you with people. You know, I'm just here trying to get those questions lined up for you. There's another one. Yeah, I love it. I love the questions. Let's see. There's more about PF reading the Leonard case today. Packet Fabric acts as a backbone network and for yes um so yes we do um one of the services that we provide is is dci data center inter interconnect you know building your own backbone so same as you would build with any large telco provider um Zeo, centrelink uh, you can build exactly that on packet fabric only in um approximately uh 89 days 23 hours and uh 59 minutes less time <laughs> Wow. So that's to say you can build it. Yeah, you can build it in about a minute, right? Like you could build a hundred gig backbone that spanned from Sydney to um, the UK with several locations in the US as well, you know, in about as long it took you took you to do all those clicks. So five minutes or so. And uh, uh, honestly, my some of the companies that I work with are, uh, you know, your customers and I all 
hear nothing but great things about working with you. But one thing that really impresses me that, uh, you know, you guys display your pricing publicly, uh, who's, what kind of decision, uh, you know, taking strategy you guys follow by displaying that. And by the way, like very aggressive pricing, right? I, I was just looking for, uh, you know, here, this, this telecom industry, <laughs> do you think telecom industry is ready to have public pricing in a website where you can go click and buy it for the half the price that you would buy <laughs> from somebody else? What do you think of them about that? They're, they're, they're not ready for that, which is great, which is great for us. It's great opportunity for us. Um, I have to, yeah. I have to share this because I'm I, like, I, I knew it has been there all the time because every time I try to negotiate with Jezebel and she's like, it's on the website, man. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm like, but I don't care. Like I'm like, my job is to negotiate, right? It doesn't matter. But Mehmet, look at the price. Like what is yeah. negotiate there? So check this out, guys. Check this out here. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. It's right there. Like yep. NRC. I mean, wow. I'm, I'm just like impressed. Look at this, you know, you can just go get into detail and just knock this down. Sorry about that. I'm, uh, wow. It's, it's impressive. Anna, what kind of strategy is this? <laughs> it's, uh, Disrupt. So, definitely there's some disruption yeah. behind, right? Yes, it is. The, the, the strategy is absolutely disrupt. I mean, that that's been our, that has been our, you know, in our in our core values, you know, since day one has been automate everything and, and automate everything is allow people to serve themselves, right? That is that is the best thing. And so we started with pricing available on our public website since launch. Um, you know, it was just something I don't think there was even a question around it. You know, maybe we paused for a second. We're like, wow, nobody else is doing this. You know, this is a little scary. But then we're like, you know what, this is who we are. So we got to go with it. And that's what we will continue to do. I mean, we just want to become uh, even even more visible. Uh, and we're like, and there's a lot of other ways that I mean, we have a lot of crazy stuff on the roadmap that it would just blow people's minds in terms of you know visibility for a telecom, right? We don't want to be anything like a telecom. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's that's very good to hear, Anna. I want to thank you first of all for joining me today, but I want to let you go yeah. back to your meetings rest of today. I'm pretty sure you have a packed schedule. Any final comments you want to share with us about these days and the future? Any any comments? Um, just that uh, you know, I, I I think that connectivity is going to become even a more, you know, it's going to become a more important part of our wo our world. You know, this COVID is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, and even if it did, it's kind of one of those things that once something comes out of the box, it can't be put back in. And there's a lot of people that have discovered that there's, you know, a, a different way of life um, to communicate, you know, rather than going to the office every day or going to conferences, like you said, like virtual conferences are amazing. They really are because you can see every attendee there. It's easy to get a hold of people. It's a lot less disruptive to like your work and life. Um, so there's a lot of these things that are going to be hard to put back in the box now that they're out. And uh, we're going to just become a even more um, connected, you know, internet dependent world. Absolutely. I, I, we have one last question. I want to make sure just uh, Scott is asking, how do you approach more challenging markets like China? That is a great question. Um, yeah. And China is certainly a challenging market. So for those very, very challenging markets and, and China being being definitely the core one there, uh, we look for partners. Um, we look in China is oddly enough one of the places where a automated network very similar to packet fabric um uh exists and so really yeah yeah it's um it's pretty interesting and so you know our, our strategy there would be to partner with somebody like that and and china is really a very unique region in that it is probably the one area we would do um something like that awesome thanks again anna yep. ladies and gentlemen Anna Claiborne from Packet Fabric joined me today. This is it for this week. Tomorrow I have another guest, but this will be about no technology at all. Thanks, Anna, once again. Right. Thanks for watching us. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.